we uh, had a meeting at the office. We were running Hartford or I think Hartford, Connecticut or one of the Connecticut towns. And we had a meeting. He had called for me, Jimmy Hart, and Randy and Liz to come to the office for a meeting. And I had no idea why. None. None. Zero. And we we're in the office and sitting there and he and Pat Patterson's there and he goes over this scenario of actually Jimmy and I got there first and Randy and Liz came later because they had been over at Dick Ebersaw's house that afternoon and uh, we had to rent a car and we drove over and Randy and Liz was shuttled over by limo from Ebersol's house. Why did Ebersol want them? I guess they were talking about what they were going to be doing for the Saturday night main oh. event. Oh. It's nice to not include me. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> so we waited on them for about a half hour, and Vince really did, wasn't talking or anything like that. And, and uh, we kind of just waited around, Jimmy and I did, in like a little meeting room until then they showed up, and here they are. And of course, Vince, how was everything over at Dick's house? Ooh, yeah, very good, yeah, nice. What they doing at Ebersol's house? Mm -hmm. So uh, we go in and sit down, and then Vince starts talking to Randy and Liz, as if I wasn't even there. He's talking to them, telling them. And we're gonna do this and we're gonna do that. Now are you saying anything at this point? You're no, just I'm letting just, Vince... I'm listening. Okay. I'm listening as <laughs> Your future's being decided by others. <laughs> what the fuck am I doing here? You could have called me by phone and told me this. I think we had worked in the Meadowlands the night before. Uh, and, and, and we had Hartford, so coming up from the Meadowlands, stop in at the office before you go up to the building. Uh, I think Hartford was the next town closest to, or New Haven. New Haven was closest. That's where we're going, New Haven. That's the closest to the office, to Stanford, I think. Okay. And, uh, but we had worked in the Meadowlands down here in New Jersey the night before, and on the way up, we stopped in, uh, to the office for a meeting. Jimmy, what, what, why do we got to go up there? I don't know. It's something about the Saturday night main event, I guess, because I knew, I knew I was going to be wrestling Randy on the Saturday night main event. Right. And uh, they, they, they just talk. And Pat's sitting there, and and it's going to be wonderful, and this, and Randy, if it's all over, you climb up, you drop the elbow on Honky Tonk Man, and one, two, three, and you put Liz up on your shoulder, and you sashay her around, and the music's playing, and and he looks over at me and he says, and Jimmy, uh, after the one, two, three, you pull, and now he's still not looking at me. And Jimmy, you pull Honky out of the ring, and then he looks at me and said, and Honky, you won't be seen again. But we're going to rebuild you. Okay. I wanted to say, you're going to fucking rebuild me like the $6 million man. We can rebuild him. You know, they do rebuild people now. They do in WWE. Guys go out and they lose all the time and they get rebuilt right. or they get repackaged. But back then, being rebuilt or repackaged was something that just didn't happen. Especially you don't repackage S.D. Jones. You don't repackage... Pedro Morales. You don't repackage a Chief Day J. Strongbow or a Rowdy Roddy Piper or Cowboy Bob or how are you gonna repackage him? Shave his head and bring him back as a German? And everybody nobody's gonna know it? Do you say that? No, I'm just sitting there ex just totally in shock and deflated. Like I have no air in this room. And I'm totally outnumbered because Pat's obviously on Vince's side, Randy's happy, and Liz is happy. They've already talked to Ebersol. They've already got another side of the story that I don't know, and I've been ambushed on this. And 
he when he said we're we're gonna re we he didn't say repackage. He said when he said he pulled pulled me out of the ring, and Honky, you won't be seen again. As soon as he said I wouldn't be seen again, I took that as I am fired. I am not to be seen again. Not to be seen that night on camera. No, I mean, give me the words. I mean, what could you say, Vince, that would have made me happy? You're not, we pull you out of the ring, take you to the back so you, you won't be on camera while Randy's sashaying around and everything, and then here's what we got for you in a program. Nothing was mentioned other than we could, we're going to rebuild you. As what? So where do you leave it that day? Hmm? Where do you leave it that day? Do you, do you raise any objection at the table no. at the time? No. Does Jimmy? No. 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 I just, we got up. Okay. See you guys tonight. New Haven. I got Randy. I'm resting him that night anyways. See you guys up there. They stay in the office. And Jimmy and I humbly walk out like, you know, whip little fucking puppies. And uh, I go straight to pay phone. Call my wife. Right outside the office was a payphone on the corner. I said, Jimmy, here, take the keys, go get the car. I'm, I need to call home. I knew right then I was done. I knew right then. The writing was on the wall. I, I, I knew when I wasn't figured in any of these conversations and when yeah. I'm to be drug out of the ring and never to be seen again and I'm going to be rebuilt, I am finished. My wife couldn't believe it. She said, what? I said, yeah. I said, this is how the meeting went down. She said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. I said, I really don't know. I'm ready to quit right now. Mm. Do you consider that? Yes. Yes. I didn't even want to leave. I wanted to leave Stanford and go to the nearest airport and go home. Right. I had put in too much time and effort into this character, into all the trials and tri tribulations of 300 days on the road, doing all these things, battling against adversity with some of the wrestlers that I had to wrestle that weren't cooperative, Jake going into rehab and Steamboat, you know, uh, had Vince Steamboat quitting, Steamboat quitting, and they bring him back. And we have two or three return matches. And, you know, if I had beaten Steamboat that night in Buffalo like we did, we typically would have had me and Steamboat in a return matches with me and Steamboat. But now he quits. So until they book someone else with me, I'm the Intercontinental Champion, but I got substitutes. The next night, well, they didn't show the belt until about a week later that I had it. But when I picked the belt up and started going with it then and, and wrestling, I was with the substitutes again. Right. Because Steamboat was not there to defend the title, so I'm losing every night. So I go through all these steps and all these processes, and I do everything I think I'm supposed to do. I show up on time. I'm dressed. I go to every interview they ask me to go to. Six in the morning, I'll call a radio station. I'll call a radio station at midnight. I, I do everything that's asked of me because Jimmy was pushing me hard and saying, let's do this, do this, do whatever you do, blah, blah, blah. Kept, kept the energy going. Kept the, you know, the prod up the ass so that I would get up and I would go do all these things and be a good soldier. And then here, boom, bam. I mean, a kick right in the nuts. And it just, we left, did, did the match in New Haven, everything, no problems. Uh, then we left and went up to uh, Calgary or Vancouver and started a Canadian run across Canada. Towns were sold out every night, Randy and I, every night. We had been sold out every night. We'd been sold out before this, when he was telling me all this. Sold out, sold out, sold out, sold out, sold out. So when do you tell Vince that this isn't going to happen? I got to Winnipeg three days later. Four day, well, actually, we had to do Haven. Then we went to Vancouver, then Calgary. I think Calgary or Edmonton, and then uh, Winnipeg about four days later. It had been 
gnawing at me. <laughs> and you're not given any any indication that there's a problem. You're not given any no. shade to Randy no. or okay. No. Uh -uh. So so take me there. What happens? What's the discussion? Uh I called Jim Barnett in Atlanta. Oh. Yeah. And he said, whatever you do, don't don't lose on TV. Not on that show. He said, it's going to be one of the biggest shows in the history. And he said, if you go out there and they destroy you on that show, you're finished. Were you calling well, him I knew for that. an advice? Were you calling him for advice or for a spot? Both. Okay. <laughs> As I whistle. Both. Uh, Would you have taken the belt onto uh, Georgia Television? No, I'd have just left it with Jimmy Hart or whoever. Okay, I'd just sit here and take this fucking thing back. <laughs> I wouldn't. I didn't want to carry it around anymore after that. I mean, it did. It, I didn't even carry anymore after that. Right. I didn't. I mean, I mean, all the luster, everything was gone. Everything, everything was gone. So Barnett says, "Don't do it." Barnett says, "Don't do it. Whatever you do, don't do it." And I said, "Well, Jim, it's you know, I'm, I obviously I can't stick around here." And he said, don't do anything, but whatever you do, don't do that. And he said, where are you tomorrow? I said, we're going to Halifax. He said, how are the towns doing? I said, we're sold out every night. He said, yeah, I know you, you guys, you're doing fabulous business. And he said, let me talk to Jimmy Crockett. And he said, I'll get back with you tomorrow. Don't say anything, don't do anything till you talk to me tomorrow. We'll set a meeting up in the Bahamas. And he said, when you, he said, well, actually he told me to call back the next day because he, he didn't know my schedule. He said, and when you call back, use your real name. He said, I don't know who in my office, in my office. is <laughs> listening. Or, That's funny. He said, use your real name. Uh, so that, because when I called, I said, this honky tonk man calling for Jim Barnett. <laughs> you know, and he's, <laughs> Wayne, my boy. Yeah, you're right. What's going on? Because he had left. WWE under sure. difficult circumstances a few months earlier. So he knew if I was calling him, there was something going on. And and I had known Jim over the years and had not really worked for him a lot, but just off and on. But he knew me from working with Jerry Jarrett, Nick Goulis, and all the guys in the South and from the Fullers, the Welches. So uh, could have been probably my biggest mistake was telling Jimmy Hart that I called Barnett. Because Jimmy mentioned it to someone? I, actually, I called Barnett in Calgary or Vancouver, one of the two. I think maybe, I think I called Barnett like the second day or the third day. And I mentioned to Jimmy Hart, I said, I called Jim Barnett. I said, uh, they they'll have a spot for me. I'm going. I'll I'll just go there. I'm not doing this. Mm -hmm. Oh no no no! Give give Vince a chance, please please. Don't just walk out. Well, obviously I understand why Jimmy was saying that. Maybe it was for personal reasons, maybe professional reasons. If I walked out and left, I mean I was a pretty good cash cow for Jimmy. I'm wearing sold out main event shows, and and uh, Jimmy gets paid according to the houses like mm -hmm. I did. And uh, he was, at that point in time, he was really just only managing me pretty much all the time. He had a couple other guys, but, no. I mean, he was, like, stuck with me. And so uh, uh, I think I did call out of Calgary, and then we went to Winnipeg the next day, and he, he had talked me into, please, 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 don't do it. Uh, give Vince a chance. Talk to Vince first. He'll understand understand the fucking guy didn't even look at me for 20 minutes in the office that day but uh he uh i got to winnipeg and it was just really eating at me bad and uh jack lanza was the agent and i called his room we stayed at the same hotel jack what do you know about this saturday night main event coming up Oh, I don't know. I don't know anything about it. I know I have to work it. You know, he didn't. He didn't know. He didn't. He know didn't that. know. They don't tell the agents what's coming down the pike. No, nah, he didn't. All he right. didn't know. He says, "I don't know. All I know is I have to work it." Because I didn't give him any indication. I just said, what, "What's what's what do you know about this Saturday night main event coming up?" <clears throat> and he said, oh, "I don't know. I'm just. I, I know I have to work. I have to be there. I have to work it." 
like he really didn't want to because, I mean, he didn't want to work it either. A lot of guys didn't want to. It was a long-ass show. Yeah. It was part of the TV tapings. It went to fucking midnight or one in the morning. And uh, so he said, and I said, uh, well, I need to talk to Vince about it. And he says, uh, okay, is there anything I need to tell him? I said, yeah, you can tell him I'm not doing that fucking job. <laughs> exact words. He said, well, I, I'll be talking to him in about five minutes. How quickly does the phone ring in your hotel? About five minutes. <laughs> And it was Howard Finkel. Oh, okay. And he said, you know, hello, how you doing? Uh, I understand that you'd like to talk to Vince about the uh, what what we're doing on the Saturday night main event. And I proceeded to tell Howard, which I knew. Now that now looking back, I know they had me on speaker. Okay. It wasn't like Vince is getting ambushed. He's he's hearing it right now, coming out of my mouth going into Howard's ear, into the speaker, and it's broadcast over the network. So, <laughs> and then Vince gets on the phone, and I just unpolitely told him, go fuck himself. I wasn't doing it. What does he say? He didn't like it. But are you making a case that, Vince, are you looking at the houses? I did Why that. would yeah. you do yeah, this? I said that. Look said what that. we built. I said that after, you know, as I was telling him that, you know, this is not going to happen. And then I made the second mistake. I said, I've already talked to Jim Barnett. Oh, fuck, he went nuts. What is that? Are you fucking kidding me? Why would you talking to him? What did you have to talk to Jim Barnett about? I said, well, obviously I didn't get anything to talk to you about. <laughs> you know, I sat said, at your table for two yeah, hours. Yeah, I said, we're doing sell out fucking business, Vince. And, you know, I just, I got a new house and a new baby at home. And I said, brother, this thing is, you know, rebuilding of me ain't going to happen. Well, that's about the dumbest fucking, he was the dumbest fucking thing you could ever do. I said, I don't think it was at all. He said, so you're not going to do the show then? I said, no, I'm not doing the fucking show. I said, in fact, if you want the goddamn belt, I'm taking it to Memphis with me, and if you want it, it'll be over to my mantle on my fireplace, and if you think you can beat me, put your fucking tights on, come down to Memphis and try to beat me. I said, it's your belt. You can have it back. I said, I'll lose that belt to two people. Hogan, because he helped bring me in there, and you, because it's your belt, if you think you can beat me. And that was it. Jim Helwig wasn't on that list at the time? No. Okay. No. And then <laughs> and then that was pretty much uh that was pretty much it and and until uh, uh until uh that night in Winnipeg was real like walking on eggshells and I called Randy over and I and I, I told him. I I called I got Randy over, pulled him to the side and him and Liz and, and told him the whole story. And why? And he understood, because he had been a promoter and he had been a booker right. and he had owned a territory with his dad and mm -hmm. he had gone through these things and he understood and it was nothing. I, and he, he understood it was nothing against him. And a lot of people want to make it that I didn't want to do this job for Randy. It was not. It was so far from the truth. I think Lanny might have even been in the. And I let them all come in. Come here, guys. I want to talk to you a minute. And, and I, I let them know the whole story of what was going on and why and my reason behind it. Mm -hmm. And they understood. And, and they, they know that if it happened to them, they would have done the same thing. Right. I mean, we were, we were at a point in our careers where we had no contract. Yeah. I mean, my contract was up with WWE. It was a 10-day contract. The first, day, first 10 days I worked, the contract was in value. Right. It, was, it was done. It, it, it had performed itself. So that's what we did. And then they we ended up... Uh, Vince says he, he says there's a million finishes. I said, well, if there's a million fucking finishes, why'd you want to do that one? I just felt like it. He didn't. He did not give me that courtesy, that handshake deal that we. I thought we solidified when I went to work for him, when I shook hands with him, and he hired me. 
Had he sat you down at the table alone, maybe without Now, when Randy. we shook hands and he hired me, yeah. I said, I'll do everything I can for you. Just keep me good on television. And he knew what that meant. Do not beat me on TV. Understood. And I don't know how he could have explained it to me. To make it work for To you. make it work, especially when we didn't have any kind of contract other than a handshake. And now your handshake don't mean anything. I just felt, I felt the, the vibes from the people in the office and from Vince himself that I couldn't be trusted anymore. And uh, it was downhill after that.